Yeah, yeah let's face it. Some guys are born with it, and other guys just live their whole life and don't even know it is there. <laughs> Already the ones who say, whoa, whoa, what do you mean, what, what, what? That's right, buddy. You've just proved that you ain't, I mean, it just ain't. That's all. There's no way to argue. You just got to got to play it for what it's worth. You know, before we get underway here, I, uh, uh, I've i been meaning to do this for a long time. And uh, something that I heard just a couple of uh, minutes ago... Uh, uh, made me decide that this is the time to do it because it's true. You, you have that little cheer in there. Uh, would you please uh, give me a short uh, but uh, totally spontaneous and completely uncontrolled cheer, please? That's the kind of cheer we need. Now, I'm doing this for a specific purpose here. I just... Now, that cheer was, was, uh, was uh, perpetrated for uh, a specific uh, type of uh, victim of uh, late 20th century life. Now, unsung, unheralded, and uh, I might add completely uh, underground in their total suffering. And these are the people who work in the so-called music radio stations across the land. That is one of the worst, absolutely, if not the worst job in all of American life. Incredible. <laughs> now, I've just given that little cheer. Now... Now, uh, now, what is, uh, why is this so? You know, a lot of people sitting out there think that would be a great thing to have happen to them, you know? That's because they don't know anything about it. It's like, it's like a kid that loves candy, thinking how, what a great job it would be to work in the candy factory. Well, I can tell you this. You spend six weeks working in a candy factory, buddy, and you're going to lay off chocolate for the rest of your long-born days. Do you know? Do you know right here? You're, look at, you're looking at a guy. <laughs> you're looking at a guy. <laughs> who, even though occasionally he will pretend, you're looking at a guy who, let's, this is almost un-American, what I'm about to say, and I don't want to be misunderstood, but it is, it's a, it's a truth. I honestly cannot truly say that I can frankly, and without qualms, look a hamburger in the eye. I hate hamburgers. That's right. I'm sorry. I hate hamburgers. And you're going to say, why do you hate hamburgers? Well, friend, one hellish August, I worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day, at an impressionable age, 16, in a hamburger joint. I made hamburgers from 5 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock at night. I did this on Monday. I did this on Tuesday. I did this on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then I made an encore appearance on Sunday. And then proceeded to begin the week all over again on Monday. I was what they call a vacation replacement. So I worked seven days a week. I replaced everybody. And it was unbelievable. I grew to honestly and sincerely hate the smell of a charcoal broiled hamburger. And I began thinking, what a guess. Oh, wow, you know, because there's nothing a kid likes better than a hamburger, right? Any kid. I thought to myself, what a guess, you know. Hamburgers, we, the place, you know, we served Cokes, a whole bit. It was a true hamburger joint, you know. It was a, it was a McDonald's type joint. And uh, it was great, you know, had, had fake brick fireplaces in there, you know, with the fake uh, charcoal broilers and the whole bit. Oh, it was just terrific. It had the had the infrared lights. Oh, it was a good place. It wasn't, it wasn't a sloppy Joe's. It wasn't a greasy spoon, nothing like that. This was a, a you know, really a big time. It had a big parking lot all around where the kids come in, you know, with their mercuries and all that. Well, I want to tell you, friend, uh, it began to set in roughly, that, let's put it this way, the malaise began to set in about Tuesday of the second week. This was roughly... Uh, eight or nine days into my uh, voyage across the stormy seas of uh, revelation. Well, uh, and, and how did it happen? Well, because I'll tell you how it happened. Every day, you see, we would have this lunchtime. You know, the, no matter what kind of a galley slave you are, they occasionally give you time to, uh, you know, stoke the boilers so that you can work even harder, right? I mean, even, even uh, Simon Legree learned that you had to leave the slaves eat once in a while so that they could pick more cotton in the afternoon. 
God, just think what it would have been like when Simon Legree was around if they had lighted cornfields and lighted cotton fields so they could work all night, 24 hours a day, you know. So uh, nevertheless, I, I <laughs> oh, man, that, at first, when the lunchtime came up, seeing the boss, a Mr. Clifford Drummond, uh, his name is tattooed forever on the piccolily section of my mind, Mr. Clifford Drummond, uh, who uh, he wore the blue, blue, you know, the blue blazer, uh, and he was the boss. He'd, he'd, he'd walk around in the back and uh, he'd poke the French fries and all that stuff. And uh, he he said uh, when you, when when I came to work, he said, "Now look," he says, "One thing, one of the great uh, side advantages of this job, kid, is that you you, you can have all the hamburgers you want at lunchtime." He says, uh, "When when lunchtime, I don't want no 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 help ever. None of you guys ever eating when you're on duty ever." Now, you notice when you go to McDonald's, you don't see those guys walking around eating hamburgers while they're serving you. No, that's the absolute rule. No eating. He said, however, when you have lunchtime, you can have all the hamburgers you want. You can have a double cheeseburger if you anything. You just go ahead, go, go ahead. Because he knew, see. <laughs> I, I thought, gee, that's kind of nice. You know, a guy could knock down $15, $20 worth of hamburgers, you know, being a 16-year-old kid uh, in your lunch hour, which was a one-hour lunch hour. So, uh... The first week, that's exactly what I did. The first week would come up, you know, and uh, the first day, first lunch hour came, I could hardly wait for it, you know. The lunch hour comes, and uh, Mr. Clifford Drummond said, uh, take your apron off, kid, you got an hour off, whatever you want, he says, but don't eat around here. He said, uh, so I go in the back, and I say, hey, Lenny, uh, make me three cheeseburgers, make me a, uh, uh, mm, let's see, uh, how about a couple of quarter pounders, and... Uh, I'll follow it up with uh, some of the uh, pumpkin pie, and uh, I'll have uh, seven gallons of Coke, uh, two milkshakes. I'll have a malt, and, uh, well, uh, let's see. Uh, how about uh, how about one of them fish sandwiches, too? What the hell? So at that point, when he looked at me with a funny look, he'd been working there for a year. He says, okay. So he starts to cook it up. Well, <laughs> I go out in the back, you know, with my giant bag of hamburgers, and I'm scoffing. I love it, see. Well, the second day... I proceeded to do exactly the same. And it was even more fun, you know, because they were really good. So the third day, uh, I, you know, suddenly just hit, just like that. It was just like somebody threw a curtain. Uh, Tuesday came in the second week. Remember, I started on a Monday. This was seven, eight days into my, my uh, strange voyage in the rocky seas of, of uh, well, I don't know how to describe it, possibly understanding that there's more to life, friends, than a charcoal broiled quarter pounder. Uh, nevertheless, it came Tuesday, see, and I'm off I'm with my, my lunch hour, so I, I walk, wander back to where Lynn was something suddenly in my head says, Stop it! You can't stand it! And I turn around, I said, oh, Listen, Lenny, uh, uh, at first I didn't quite understand it, see. I thought it maybe I was a little off my feet at first, see. So I said, uh, Hey, look, Lenny, uh, look, uh, I... Uh, uh, I'll come back in about a half an hour. So I wandered out in the back. See, I didn't even uh, didn't even uh, bother to order a hamburger. And Lenny looked at me. See, but this time he looked at me with a kind of smirk. You know, Lenny'd been there before. See, I noticed. I had noticed that none of the other kids ever ate there. They'd just take off. You know, lunch hour comes, zap, they're gone. I was the only one who would squat in the back on one of those stone tables and knock down a hamburger. See, so <laughs> I took off and I go wandering down the street. See, I'm walking along, and. Um, I'm walking along, see, and I go past this uh, this restaurant, and suddenly I'm hungry. I'm hungry, see, because he has a sign in the window that said, special, bacon and eggs. Uh, with <laughs> So I go in, I have bacon and eggs. See, it was great. Well, I, I, I thought I was, at first, I thought I was being very disloyal and kind of, you know, kind of rotten and sick and all that. So uh, I knock down the bacon and eggs, and uh, I go wandering back after another half hour and back into the, into the hamburger joint, put on my, my uh, apron. We had these uh, red, white, and blue aprons. They were great. And I had a red, white, and blue hat and all that. Yeah. Uh, and so I go back in there, see, and I start making hamburgers. And uh, just like normal. Well, the next day comes out, and I didn't even go back to see Lenny. I just cut out the front door. Bap! Just like that. I go down the street, and I stop in this joint. I had, uh, well, actually, I had meatloaf. I had uh, I had mashed potatoes. I had a little... Uh, little side order of red cabbage. And, you know, it was just a, it's the kind of meal where prior to this point, when I was 16, I would have said, oh, come on, I want to go down, I got a hamburger, ah, you know. So that was the beginning of the end. Soul-searching. I tossed that night on the daybed, and I thought to myself, what's the matter with me? 
you know, everybody else, all my friends, you know, I'd come home, 7 o'clock, everybody, you know, everybody's going out. They all, they'd go out and they'd go to the hamburger joints and hang around, you know. I suddenly did not have any desire to go sit in a parking lot, you know, and eat hamburgers and uh, holler out the window at a car and all that stuff, you know. <laughs> Just no way. And you know, it has never returned. I consider this a great lack in me, and I don't know why, uh, uh, I feel so uh, conscience-stricken in that, but I do, because I know that, that I'm no longer in the mainstream. No longer. So when that girl, you know, comes out TV and she starts singing, hold the pickles, hold the mustard, I said, buddy, baby, honey, you can hold it all. Hold it all. Hold every damn bit of it, buddy. Yeah, baby, hold it, hold it. Even a sesame seed bun, you know what you can do with that? Give me a cheer there, please. A little cheer, Alvin, please. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Incredible. All right, uh, would you please hit the uh, D-E-A-U-X button immediately after I announce that this is your friend on the dials. Yes, sir, eh? this is your electronic cousin. Sitting out here just waiting and holding your hand and giving you all these good things and soothing you and kissing you on your furrowed brow before you go to your, your, uh, your sleepy, tossed sea of uh, unconscionability. <laughs> How do you like that? You want to hear reminiscences of uh, Shepard and the showbiz friends? <laughs> Which, let's face it, friends, I'm part of. You better understand it. So I'm walking down a street. Uh, it was on the, actually, it was on the McDougal Street. And uh, I'm walking down McDougal Street, see, so going downtown, and uh, I see this huddled figure coming towards me. And he was wearing a great big hat, uh, a really terrible-looking hat, and uh, he was uh, wearing black glasses, trying to look inconspicuous. I figured, you know, it's another panhandler. And uh, have you noticed in, in New York now, no matter what part of town, if you slow up and uh, pause to look at a window, invariably there's a, a head looking over your shoulder. Uh, say, uh, hey, buddy, you mean? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, God. So uh, never, you know, I saw I've taken the offensive. What I do now is, is I, I ask people first before they do me. Guy comes up to me, I said, I'm going to ask you, you got any money? And, I, 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 and he turns around, he gets, you know, so he gets, you know, he figured, he figured for me, you know, I was a mark. Uh, well, I am a mark, but not that kind. So uh, no, everybody's a, a mark, but uh, some of us, you know, you have a specialty in your markism. Some people are guru marks. In other words, you buy one guru, you'll buy 5,000. There are other people that are diet book marks. You buy one diet book, you're going to buy 20,000. You're going to try every, every known diet. Never lose any weight, but you're going to try every damn diet that comes along. Then <laughs> so everybody's a mark, you know. It, uh, it depends on what you're a mark for. Uh, yeah, did you hear the line in that, that commercial about, uh, about the Godfather, you know, part two and all? You know, I have a feeling that if you were able to be reborn in the year 2070, 75, that's good, you know, 100 years, that uh, you would see on the marquees, Godfather, part 728, and uh, <laughs> the saga of the great... Well, <laughs> I'm getting very un-American. Have you noticed that? In the most fundamental ways. See, being anti a politician or the political system is not un-American. No, that's in the American mainstream. We started out as a revolutionary country, you know. That's truly American all the time, all the time fetching, uh, you know, all the time yelling about the horrible oppressors, whoever they might be, you know. <laughs> Even if the, the guy you just put in, five minutes later, you say, ah, boom, what are you? Oh, yeah. New York, New York is like that. Elects a mayor 20, it elects a mayor, remember. The mayor is not elected by Louisville, Kentucky, and sent here. No way. New York elects a mayor, and five minutes after we end, you're getting that. You get in your the first cab ten minutes after the election. You get in a cab, and uh, you sit down, and all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of cars ahead of you, traffic, and you what? What, what do you what do you think the guy says? He says, "Look at that. When are you going to do something about the traffic?" And you say, "Well, I don't know." He's yeah, that bum that's in. You know that guy? What's his name? Beeb. Let me tell you. And you say, "Well, he's only been in ten minutes." Ah, oh, that bum. You know. So you, you gotta you gotta understand that is in the mainstream of American life to be anti-political. It's, it's no, and, and yet every comic that does it pretends he's an iconoclast. No way, friend. 
No way. As a matter of fact, a true iconoclast today is a guy that likes the government. Now, that would really cause excitement. Uh, you don't think that the establishment likes the government, do you? Are you kidding? It is believed that they do. What do you think Nixon was part of? He was part of the establishment, not the government. <laughs> you don't think that... <laughs> Very different, Fred. And, you, and the, the, the establishment really is mad at the government all the time. That started back in Teddy Roosevelt's day. In fact, it started back in Washington's day. They kept passing them damn laws. Who do they think they are telling me that I can't run the international press company and the international tinfoil cartel organization the way I want to run it, huh? Who do they think they are? Uh, nothing but a bunch of politicians, pipsqueaks. They don't know what... You know, so this is... Uh, you don't think... Uh, Oh, boy, I'll tell you. It is a, this is a common misapprehension of the non-establishment types. They believe the establishment works hand-in-hand hand with the government. It fights the government tooth and nail at all times. Oh, <laughs> they have 50,000 lawyers, sometimes blocks of lawyers, whole towns of lawyers, to do nothing but fight the government. <laughs> Look at the taxes. What am I going to do? Here they go at the welfare. You know, oh, my God almighty. I'll tell you. <laughs> Now I'm going to get a letter. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. I'm taking it not in vain. I'm taking it in its basic context. Hear that? Shut up. All right. So, uh, God, what a strange show. So, <laughs> nevertheless, it is, really. You just uh, you just touched the thing here. So, anyway, <laughs> I'm going to tell you the story about Charlie. I don't know why I, should, why I started with this. Charles Nelson Riley's coming down the street. So <laughs> I said, oh, Charlie, how are you? And Charlie says, hello, how are you? I says, I, remember me? Says, yeah, yeah, oh, wow. You know, Charlie's the kind of guy that grabs a hold of you and kisses you on the ear, you know, and all that. I said, come on, Charlie, cut it out, will you? He said, oh, come on, love me, please, please. I said, Charlie, stop it now. We're grown-up men, now stop it here. I said, where have you been coming from? He said, well, well, he says, I just came from the dedication of the Charles Nelson Riley Off-Broadway Showcase for Your Talents Theater. <laughs> I said, what do you made, Charlie? Come on. He said, yeah, he says... He says, get in the place. I've been in 47 off-Broadway shows. Each one was supposed to be a showcase for my talents. And look at me. I'm still in these showcase shows. It's been 117 years since I left New York State. Comes from upstate New York, you know. I says, Charlie, I said, that's your role in life. He says, yeah, that's right. I'm off the party. And he walks down the street singing away. Everything's coming up, roses. And I says, no, Charlie, it ain't. Uh, so Charlie's still sticking in there. <laughs> well, nevertheless, you want to hear... Uh, no, I, I, I just have to say, though, that the being anti... Uh, you, to be truly anti-American, to be truly un-American, is to not like hamburgers. That's, that's, that's a very un-American thing. It is. Yes, it's, it's, it's even more un-American to, uh, to say, for example... <laughs> have no interest at all in politics. That's truly un-American. Well, that, that, uh, that's, that's way out of the American mainstream. Oh, completely. Uh, and it's also completely un-American to not believe, ultimately, that the reason that you're having problems is not because of the other guys doing it, the evil society, evil environment, evil this, evil that, but it's because you just simply ain't got the talent. That's un-American, of the ultimate. <laughs> I'm just saying there's many kinds of un-American attitudes, and, and uh, you'll, look, you'll be looked upon as a, a real cuckoo bird. Uh, and and uh, the worst kind of an un-American thing is to laugh at it all. Oh, man. Oh, listen, you get into a dedicated crowd that's walking around with signs, and uh, you say, hey, you know, never, <laughs> you look awful funny. <laughs> Stand with that dumb sign, you know, walking around waving like that, <laughs> hitting people with it that says love on it. <laughs> oh, no way. That's, that's, a, that's the ultimate un-American. But, because uh, then he thinks you're for the other guys. He says, oh, no, 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 no. He says, what are you? Are you for those evil oppressors? He says, no, no, I was just, I just left the evil oppressors demonstration. And, uh, <laughs> and I laughed like hell there. They kicked me out, too. Uh, da, 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 dee, dee, dee. <laughs> La -da 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 -tee. Listen, I'll tell you another one like that. If you want to hear another one, this uh, this friend of mine who plays uh, who plays dynamic young private eye international adventurer type guys on on uh, 
on the, on the silver screen everywhere. Uh, you know, dynamic. I mean, he's always on the talk show. He's really something else. See, so at least he plays that. Underneath it all, he's pure old Charlie Schlepp. And uh, yes, he is. That's the truth of most actors. See, so he, he plays these dynamic things. See, and before he goes on stage or on the screen, see, they have to spray him with all kinds of stuff to make him look dynamic. And he really, you know, they, they put special drops in his eyes so his eyes look vibrant and, uh, and blue. You know, you know, I know one guy that has bought himself, and I don't have to tell you who it is, because you probably guess, but there's a, there's a guy I know who has a special set of, of uh, contact lenses. Now, you know, most contact lenses are just colored. You know, you get a contact lens that's colored. You can get blue, green, yellow, and all that. If you want, you can get bloodshot, and uh, yeah, you can. You get <laughs> if you want, you can get you can get the you know you can get bright yellow eyes, you know. So uh, he he has a set of contact lenses. Wait till you hear this: a special set of contact lenses that have in embedded in them. It's uh, instead of c uh, conventional color, he has embedded in them material, a very slight material that fluoresces. So this guy has these fantastic glowing blue eyes. You can't believe it. See. He takes him out, you know, and he's got the ordinary bloodshot model that everybody's equipped with. But he's got these, <laughs> he puts these things in, see. Now, mm -hmm. I, I know the guy that makes them for him, see. He says, uh, in fact, uh, one of my other friends went down there, see, and uh, how I learned about this, this buddy of mine goes down to see this, this eye guy, see, and uh, he has nothing but the elegant showbiz clientele, see. So this friend goes down there, and he's getting fitted with uh, contact lenses. I mean, he wanted them just for, you know, the most basic of all reasons. He couldn't see anything, see, so... They're, they're fitting them up. And so the guy says to him, the doctor, say, uh, uh, you, uh, would you like uh, one of our special fluorescing models? They're really something else. And uh, so he tries the pair of fluorescent models on. They put them in there, you know. And he looks at himself in the mirror, and he looked like, uh, you know, one of, these, one of these characters out of... Do you remember a movie called uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the Village of the Damned? Yeah, you know, all these kids with these glowing eyes. He's fantastic. He says, so at that point, he says, yeah, let me try him. So he walks out into the, in the ante room. See, and there's this chick sitting there typing away there. And he turns those fantastic orbs on her, see. And she looked up and says, oh, oh, you're fantastic, unbelievable. Here, take me right here in the office. And so he says, oh, wow. So he went back in immediately and ordered three dozen pairs. He's got them in green, yellow, cerise, purple. And uh, so <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? Oh, you're learning a lot. Well, this friend of mine, another friend, see, this is the, the dynamic type. See, he's got all that stuff going. He's got contact lenses and everything else. See, so he, uh, one day he's uh, playing the stage role, see. So it happened right here on Broadway, very embarrassing moment. And see, he's known. He's, he's a dynamic, whoa, whoa, whoa. He's a dynamic Steve McQueen type, you know, dynamic, always hitting guys and, and uh, playing Marines and all that kind of stuff. So he comes out, his first moment coming out on the stage in the, the, this particular play, see, you know, where he makes the entrance. He's the star. So he makes the entrance, and everybody goes, hey, you know, like that, see. And uh, in this particular scene, he's he, actually in this play, he, it's kind of a costume play. So he's going to turn of the century type, and he's wearing a Homburg hat, you know, and he's got one of these elegant uh, Chesterfield coats with the, with, the, uh, with the velvet collar and the, the cummerbund and all that, see. Very elegant, see. So he makes the entrance. He says, this, this rake, this fantastic rake. So he comes in and he says, Ah, oh, my dear. And uh, immediately the, the, the uh, star S, the staress, the, uh, the star lady type comes sweeping up to him. She's wearing her turn of the century gown. And uh, she says, I am so glad you're here, Reginald. And he says, Oh, my dear, you look ravishing tonight. And at that, he takes off his hat with a great sweep, and off comes his hat, and in stuck in a hat is his toupee. Comes right off. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Whoa, he goes like that. And the crowd cheers. Fantastic. Well, uh, he, it was a terrible moment, see. He didn't know that it happened, though. And he proceeded with his speech, and then he felt this terrible draft. And uh, so, you know, well, anyway. <laughs> It was downhill from that time on. This happened to be opening night on top of it. Well, it, we started out tonight, and I'm going to have to get back to this, if you don't mind. I really have to. That, uh, seriously, though, I think one of the true victims of modern life is the engineer, uh, the engineer who works in a so-called total music station of any type. I don't care whether it's, whether it's, uh, whether it's music that... Uh, insistently uh, concerns itself with Kierkel listings 
or whether it's uh, uh, whether it's a contemporary or hard rock or whatever you name, friends, it is a B O R E of the ultimate kind, ultimate, unbelievable. I've known, yeah, I've known engineers. Well, for example, uh, well, uh, we don't name no names. I know one guy that, that in less than, uh, what was it, around six, seven months, something like that, lost something like 40 pounds. 40 pounds. Now, why did he lose 40 pounds? Well, because boredom. This curious thing happens to, the, to these people. Uh, as this stuff goes on and on and on, and he happened to be in a rock station. That doesn't matter. On and on and on and on. It, it plays tricks with your head. And it doesn't space you. I mean, if you think, oh, wow, oh, grass, oh, not at all. It turns your head into yogurt. It's uh, funny. Yeah, and, uh, and what's worse, a second-grade yogurt, you know, a kind of a bad yogurt. And uh, it just sits there. And, and I've known guys that were totally hip on music, you know, completely, you know, that's all they lived for was music. See, you, you put them in that seat... And within eight or nine months, they have a blank stare, you know, looking out. They still pretend they like it. They say, hey, man, man. You know, but you know that if you stuck a pin in them, there would be no reaction whatsoever. That, uh, and and uh, curiously enough, it, it affects almost every, every possible end of the guy's life. He, he stops eating. He immediately, uh, he immediately begins. First of all, his, his conversation drops off to practically nil. They tend to say nothing for hours on end. <laughs> yeah, it's curious. All kinds of things happen to them. They, they go undergo personality changes, too. Now, you know that there's a... There's a now, I'm going to be serious with you for a moment here, if you don't mind. Uh, and, I, and, you know, <laughs> being serious in our day is often uh, in itself un-American. But if, you, if, you, uh, if you're curious about what... Uh, what, what I'm not kidding, you know. I'm not. I'm not making any any jokes about this. That uh, that there is beginning to be a school of clinical psychological research that is 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 investigating the effect of continual rhythmic sound. Now that means music, continual rhythmic sound. What it does ultimately, psychically and physically, to the human organism. Did you know of such a thing? And they find they find a very interesting thing. For one thing, uh, it it it, it the, uh, some of the initial findings are fascinating. Uh, one of them is, of course, that the that the will of the individual almost completely disappears. He becomes he becomes almost a uh, uh, a noodle. Uh, he he. In addition to that, there are other ramifications. Among them, uh, loss of weight quite often. They say that one of the reasons a lot of rock freaks never eat is because of rock, <laughs> not because of vanity. Uh, and and uh, this is also true of other forms of music, not just rock. No, 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 no. It's, uh, it goes the whole spectrum. It's the rhythmic uh, sound concept that we're de dealing with here. So don't, don't think this is an anti-music remark. I'm merely saying what happens when the human creature, the animal in us, is subjected to, let's say, an overdose of this, like, say, 24 hours a day or 10 hours a day over a long period of time. Fascinating. You know, the only, the only fiction writer that I ever saw, who ever dealt with this, is uh, a very interesting uh, small section in a great book called The Once and Future King. Uh, yes, uh, who wrote it? Quick. Now, you should know this. Uh, uh, an, uh, an excellent English writer, and he wrote a section where where Merlin uh, was uh, teaching the young king uh, about life, and among other things, he turned him into an ant. And he was in an ant hill, and over and over in the ant hill, there was a sound that just kept going, and the ants were reduced to complete mechanical uh, ant-like behavior. They 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 moved the sand forward. And all because of the sound that just went on and on and on and on. It's very interesting. Uh, and they also find that people who are in this problem with the continual sound uh, are very easily herded. They become herd creatures very quickly. And they become addicted to that sound, ultimately. <laughs> yes, 
they become addicted to it. It's just like it's just like it's a kind of a it's a kind of a well, it's an autistic thing in a sense. Uh, you know, uh, the problem of an autistic person who can't, has to rock back and forth, back and forth. They become addicted to the rocking, even though at the same time they would love to stop it, but they become addicted to it. They can't, they can't stop. And so the endless sound of music, the endless sound that keeps drifting, it's always, and always at a constant, almost subliminal level on the radio. They're just coming out of the... Coming out of that, that that monitor speaker endlessly, 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 and it uh, it produces a produces a very interesting effect on people. Now I'm 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 not going to name names, but uh, there's no point in it. But I know I know one guy, at least one friend of mine, who just a few years ago was a very interesting, sharp, uh, funny, uh, a fascinating guy to be around. And he got himself a job in a rock station, and is still at that rock station. And now, when 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 you're around him, it's like you're around. Uh, it's hard to explain what it is. It's 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 a zombie-like quality. Yeah. And he's on the air, by the way. This is not an engineer. This guy I'm talking about. It produces a yeah. It produces a curious thing in anybody that's there long enough, always around it. And. Uh, it's, it's no comment, no, no anti-music remark I'm making here. I'm talking about a, a field of investigative, uh, uh, psychological, clinical work that is going on right now. And I've observed it in friends of mine, people around me. And they get, the, they get a sense of unreality. That's another interesting thing. It's, it's, as if, it's as if there's no real point of contact. They drift in and out. Uh, another thing they've noticed is a, is, a, is a tremendous change of their sex lives, for, for instance. Did you know that? That's another. Because it affects almost every facet of the person's uh, uh, nervous system in a curious way. It, uh, it deadens him to many things. Very, very interesting. And, and, and I don't think you've ever heard this discussed, have you? Ever. I mean, uh, I'm talking about in the mass media. <laughs> well... <laughs> I don't make the news, friends. I'm reporting it here. <laughs>